Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, CC, hello and welcome at CC, hello and welcome at one, two, three, four, five, six. She sells seashells by the seashore. She sells seashells by the seashore. <laughs> there we go, rolling. Every documentary, you are an entrepreneur and making that come to realization to be a piece, to be a film. You know, you're the entrepreneur, producing, directing, whether you get to have a team, the luxury of having a team or not, you're putting it together and making it happen. It's important to follow your heart and to follow your dreams, and especially if you think that it, it can make an impact on other people's lives. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 46. And it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, the Documentary Life Podcast, and the Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. When I was hired on for my first job as an editor, it was it was for a feature-length documentary called Bomb Hunters. We'd spent six months going all around the country of Cambodia filming villagers who were basically digging up old bombs, mortars, and rockets left over from decades of war, and, and they were attempting to dismantle and sell the TNT and, 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 uh, and, and metal as, as scrap. It was an amazing and intense time that, in, in more ways than one, it, it really changed the trajectory of my life. I've mentioned it a number of times on this show, how, how that particular experience, it brought me to Southeast Asia, a place that's since become a very significant part of, of both my personal as well as my professional life. And it brought me to the world of documentary. Prior to that, I had always worked um, in, in narrative. In, in fact, prior to Bomb Hunters, about 90% of my editing experience had been from cutting my, my feature-length digital video, a, a narrative film called Cascades. This was during the early days of, of Final Cut Pro. Mind you, this was back during the, you know, the second or third versions, and then later an, an HD version of the software. Before that, my, my editing experience was in linear editing on, on tape machines, uh, three-quarter inch tape machines, when I'd worked at, at a local TV news station. And then, of course, before that, um, during college. So yes, another critical thing that my experience with Bomb Hunters really brought me to was this post-production part of filmmaking, more, more specifically to editing. It was during this time that I, that I developed a love and true appreciation for the power of editing and how while the director had the vision for a film, it was the editor who really had the ability to you know shape a story into the director's vision. Spending five months in the basement of the director's house and, and going through all of the footage we'd shot in Cambodia over the course of that, that past half year and, and finding ways to assemble this into a feature doc story, up to that point, it was one of the most satisfying accomplishments in periods, really, of my life. Of course, it was also one of the most challenging times as well. You know, going through 130 plus hours of footage, much, by the way, of which was not even in English, and, and fashioning this into a two-hour film, actually it was a 90-minute film, really, it really gave me a whole new level of appreciation for the art of editing. And as most of you know, my background and foundation for my filmmaking, it really started here as a professional editor. Over the years, I, I, I've been hired to edit other documentaries, TV pilots, commercials, corporate video, sizzle reels, social media campaigns, you name it. So the other day, when it was brought to my attention that I might do some segments or shows devoted to the subject of editing, 
I was actually a bit surprised at myself that I hadn't really done much on the show about that subject. So in today's opening segment, I will begin to rectify this travesty with a segment that looks at five ways to edit more efficiently. In the coming months, I'll have on a guest or two, and we'll do some more segments about it as well. But, but yes, consider today, well, consider it a nice little start. In my opening, I mentioned having to sift through over 130 hours of footage on the first feature doc I'd ever edited. That, that was a lot of footage for anyone to have to go through, let alone a first-time editor. So as you might imagine, I did some things that I definitely would do differently on future projects. There was a lot of downtime, you know, whether it be from technical issues or simply from my lack of editing experience. But all of it was, was necessary for me to, to develop as an editor. But out of this, one of the things that I gained an appreciation for was the importance of being an efficient editor, right? Of being efficient as an editor. And what I'm going to do today is give you five ways in which you can increase your efficiency, which will then naturally lead you to becoming a better, more assured editor and more adept at the craft of storytelling. So let's take a look at five ways to edit more efficiently. Number one, have the required hardware and software. Nowadays, this has become maybe slightly less of an issue as it, maybe it was in the past, but, but nonetheless, you've got to do your due diligence and make sure that you will have the proper computing power to do what you want to do with your film when it comes to editing. Just before I was to be hired on to cut Bomb Hunters, I, I'd been using what I thought was the most recent version of Final Cut Pro, which, which if I'm remembering correctly, was, was 3.0. But when I did a, a little research, I quickly found out that FCP HD, also known as Final Cut 4, it had been released the month prior. And that if I wanted to incorporate some HD elements into our film, well, then I, I'd better make sure I'd had the newest version of Final Cut. Of course, the next thing I did was, was research what the parameters were in terms of hardware for the new version of FCP, and then quickly realized I wasn't going to have an adequate video card, and that I was probably going to need to beef up the amount of RAM in my machine. The RAM was, was relatively cheap since I could install it myself, but, but the video card was not. Through more research, I was able to find a you know a bit of a workaround so that I wouldn't I wouldn't need the new video the new video card. But but at some point, if I knew I was going to continue pursuing um, life as a professional editor, I was going to need to probably replace my machine. My point here, though, is that you don't want to find yourself in the middle of a job or 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 set to begin full scale post production on your documentary only to find out that you don't have really the, the proper machinery to do so. You don't want to be caught surprised when you know your machine can't really handle a 4K workflow or maybe even the added uh, 6K footage. Um, that is not a fun moment, trust me, especially if it's on, on a paid gig. And then you have to go back to your client and, and try explaining this situation. Or you know maybe scramble a, a couple of days before that gig to try to get a new, new machine up and running. That's, uh, that, that's definitely not, not, not a situation you want to find yourself in. So before you get to editing your doc, or, or really before you even shoot, since what you're going to be cutting with, it may inform what you used to shoot with, though I, ideally you'd rather your camera choice be purely based on your aesthetic choices, of course. But but at least before you sit down to begin editing, do yourself a favor and, and, and do the research, right? Research the specs of your laptop or desktop computer to make sure that it can smoothly edit the footage and graphics that you'll be working with. Like I said, most likely, if you're using a computer that isn't, say, more than five years old, or you're not cutting a bunch of 6K footage, you'll probably be just fine. But, but, but it is definitely worth researching beforehand instead of scrambling after the fact. Number two is to have a clean and tidy workspace. Now, this may seem a, a little bit simple to have in a segment like this, but I'm telling you right now, if you're anything like me, the more items that you have in your space or even in your periphery, the more chance that you have for distraction. So before I start editing on my docs, one of the initial things that I'll do is make sure that I've set myself up in a proper space. This, this means things like, you know, what is the orientation of my desk? Is sunlight going to be directly in my face because I'm facing a window? Um, that's probably not great for your eyes. Plus, plus, you might be tempted to watch all of the, you know, interesting things that ha no doubt happen on a continuous basis outside your window. Uh, do you have a whiteboard in your office area? If, if not, you might strongly consider. 
I always make sure that I start with a nice, clean, empty whiteboard before each um, before each project, because I make a ton of notes regarding you know anything and everything from from timeline structures, uh, additional needed B roll lists, suggestions for for possible storylines within the story. Um, yeah, anything like that. I also like to use a, a magnetic whiteboard if possible, since this this allows me to put up a few photos or other images that might offer up some inspiration. Thing is, you don't want too many because that's just, you know, it, it becomes too much to look at. And then you lose the power of, of say, a couple inspiring images. And again, it, it, it adds to um, the potential for clutter, which is, you know, kind of what we're talking about here. You, you should also make sure your desk is is pretty streamlined and clean. Only the essentials should be there. Your laptop or keyboard, a monitor or, or two if you decide on a dual screen setup, maybe a small notepad. But other than that, you want to try and keep your area really, really tight and clean. Again, the idea is to be free from potential distractions. So, you know, when you enter your space, which by the way, I like to think of as, as sacred because, because it is, this is your sacred space. This is where all of the creativity happens and, and, and the stories start taking shape. So make no mistake about it. That's, that's very sacred. Um, anyhow, when, when you enter this space, the sacred space, the idea is that you are making a conscious decision to leave everything else that's happening in your life, to leave it all behind you, to check it at the door. You're making a commitment here to being in front of your film. So, so, so anytime you make that kind of a commitment, you should treat that as such a very important commitment of your time and energy. So yeah, no distractions, no distractions. Um, you might be tempted to put up film posters or have some books lying around or some of your, your film equipment. But, but honestly, at least for me, these things just give me a reason to procrastinate um, or to put my mind in another place, which is exactly what I don't want to do. I want my mind to be on the edit on my film. Lastly, um, your edit space, it's a place where conversations happen. But those conversations are between the voices in your film and you not conversations with friends or family on, on, on your phone. So, so I think you should consider at least putting your phone on silent, if not simply putting it out of sight. Look, I get it. Emergencies happen. So, so, so I'm not going to suggest turning your phone off completely, but, but you should make a commitment to maybe only checking it every hour, you know, just to make sure that there are no emergencies that need to be tended to. Same thing with email or the internet in general. These are distractions. Force yourself to not be tempted by them. Because you know as well as I how easy it is to quickly, you know, look something up in the internet only to suddenly find yourself down, you know, an interesting rabbit hole, i.e. internet surfing hell. So, so yeah, be, be, be aware of that. Number three is use proxies. This one's something that I was hesitant to use for, for a very long time. Um, I think I may have been a little afraid that it might cause too much issues later on down the line you know, when I went to, uh, to reconnect to the actual raw camera files later on. And so it wasn't until I was actually forced on a job to use proxies in an edit that I discovered the great advantages of doing so. Now, if you're not familiar with proxies, the easiest way that I can sp explain it is, is that you're essentially making it super easy for your computer system to edit you know, with, with any kind of footage without having to transcode the footage or without your system slowing down or, or worse, just completely choking out when you try editing with, with really maybe robust footage. I first had to do this when I was editing on a project that had a bunch of, of, of 6, 6K files. Um, the turnaround in the edit was pretty fast, so, so I really didn't have time to mess around with, with rendering or, or trying to beef up my system. If you create proxies of your footage files, you're basically taking the original media and you're converting them to a fairly high quality duplicate that's roughly a quarter the size um, in file size of the original. It's also the same as what, what, what you'd call taking your edit offline. It's, it's much easier to edit with these than, than it would have been with the original much bigger files. And then once you have a final edit complete, you would simply take your edit back online by reconnecting to the raw files. Nowadays, it's actually a pretty straightforward process. Um, if you were using something like Adobe Creative Cloud, for example, you, you'd open up all of the footage in Media Encoder and, and you'd encode to one of these proxy codecs. Um, you'd encode the footage to one of these proxy codecs. Then once you were finished with your edit, once you had a, had a finalized edit, 
you would simply reconnect. This is to go to go online. This you'd reconnect um, now within Premiere at this point, assuming that's where you edited the project. You'd reconnect to the original raw files. From there, you'd simply export your final film, your final project from here or back in Media Encoder. If you know you're going to be using really big files or maybe a ton of different codecs, you really should consider editing your footage um, in with proxies. It actually doesn't take a ton of time to, to set it up for this, and, and it's well worth the headaches of having to, to constantly render and sometimes re-render footage every time you make the slightest edit or adjustment to a clip. Number four of our five ways to edit more efficiently is to create a drive infrastructure and stick to it. How many times have you opened up a brand new project on a, on a new drive and you thought, hmm, what should I call these folders? Should I put the footages from, from different cameras in different subfolders so, or entirely different folders themselves? Or, or, or should I label these by days or card numbers? Or should I, where should I put all the graphics work for the film? Are the stills to be kept in the graphics folder? Or is that a subfolder? Or how many drives do you have with all sorts of different projects with file systems that are all completely different from one another? This one, this is the absolute worst nightmare ever. Whenever you know you have to find a piece of footage or, or motion graphic file or a sound file and you realize that you've no actual system to your, your infrastructure. You just have files everywhere. To be an editor, my doc lifers, is to be anally retentive. And with good reason. You don't want to lose hours of trying to find B-roll of, of Flopsy the dog. When, when, you, when you've set up an, a, dry, a drive and file infrastructure correctly in the first place, you could go back five years into a project and probably locate Flopsy in, in, in like 30 seconds, if not even less. It's all about how, you're set, how you set up your project infrastructure on your hard drive. I started doing this about 10 years ago when a post house I'd been doing more and more work with, they insisted that their editors adhere to a very particular drive infrastructure. I mean, they figured it out pretty quickly, being a business and all. The amount of downtime that would happen every time an editor might, might open up another editor's project file and have to try and work with it. That's the worst because really everyone has their own way of setting up their projects. And understandably so, but it doesn't have to be this way. And certainly not if you're running your own business or this is your own film project. You, you shouldn't be having that issue. I'll share with you the drive infrastructure that I use. And, and while, yes, it's ever-evolving, depending on the needs of projects or sometimes just depending on advancements in technology. Um, for instance, back in the good old Final Cut Pro days, that, that would have been version 7.0 for me. When DSLRs were really big, we always had to transcode our footage. I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate and remember that one. So my filing structure always had two separate folders for footage. One labeled original footage and another labeled transcoded footage. Of course, I haven't needed to transcode footage like this in years. So eventually that folder just wasn't necessary in my infrastructure. Again, it's it, it's an evolving infrastructure. Um, the, the obvious files or the obvious folders that you're going to need will, will be things like footage, sound, graphics, project files, et cetera, et cetera. You can name them in ways that best suit you. Everyone has their own unique ways of labeling things, right? But but I'd recommend being fairly generic so as to make things easily recognizable should someone else step into your project. Um, I use titles like original footage, audio sources, graphic sources. Then within these, I'll have subfolders like music, sound files, stills, motion graphics, title cards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, again, the idea here is easy access, quick recognition, efficiency. So, so just as as you want a clean editing space. You also want a clean edit. So your hard drive structures and project files within your edit should reflect this. Remember, no distractions and minimize the downtime. I'll go ahead and post the drive and file infrastructure that I like to use. I'll, I'll post it up in the show notes, and, and you may or may not want to use it, but I'll post it in the show notes for this episode. Check it out. Let me know what you think. Feel free to use it however you may. Uh, make your own adjustments right, for what best works for you. Then if you'd like, offer up some suggestions, and, and I'll be sure and share it with the rest of the Doc Lifer community. Number five, learn and use your shortcuts. And I don't mean quick workarounds to your editing workflow when I say shortcuts. I'm talking about your actual keyboard shortcuts. I know, I know. I can hear the collective groans of about half of you. But there is a reason that they're called shortcuts. Because they save time and they work. Trust me, 
If you learn just even a minimum of, of a half a dozen shortcuts, you could literally shave off probably 25% of your editing time. And I'm being pretty conservative here. If you doubled the amount of shortcuts you use, say to, to a dozen or so, you could increase the efficiency of your editing workflow by 50%. That's a lot, people. Think about how long it takes you to use your mouse and to go up to the drop down menus and, and try and find the correct action for what you're trying to do in your edits, or, or even the relatively small amount of time it takes to go over to your tools panel. I'm telling you, if you learn the shortcuts for how to change to the splice tool or to perform an insert edit, to set or, or remove ins and out points, to perform a slip on a clip or, or to zoom in and out of your timeline, if you can do these types of things with, a, with one quick hit of a key, and bonus, if you don't even have to look down at your keys um, then through sheer accumulation of time um, imagine how much of that time you, you will have saved now multiply that for a week or even a month imagine the efficiency of your editing and the amount of time saved I'd, I'd guess you could you could double if not even triple your output compared to to if you were using the drop down menus toolbars mousing around and hunting and pecking in the, in the keyboard if nothing else please you have to at least learn and use the shuttle, the shuttle back and the shuttle forward and the stop and start functions without using your mouse. For most editing software, that's what you'd refer to as the home area where you, use, you, know, where you always want your dominant editing hand resting. Um, that's usually the J, K and L keys and the space bar area. Uh, those will allow you to quickly go through or, or step through frame by frame your footage on the fly without constantly scrubbing through with your mouse in one hand and, and tapping the space bar um, with another hand. Seriously, you have to learn and use those basic shortcuts, if nothing else. When I was first learning the shortcuts for Final Cut, I bought myself one of those slip slip over covers for my keyboard. It's like a protective cover. Um, they're color-coded highlights of the keyboard shortcuts. Once you start using those, you'll quickly remember them. Honestly, um, it's like I, I, I learn a shortcut and, and I use it about three times and then naturally and intuitively, I, I have it. I remember it. Um, there's something with the brain and motor connection there It would be my guess. Um, if I remember to, I'll take a quick snapshot of what one of these keyboard shortcut protective covers looks like and, and I'll put it up in the show notes. Mine's for Premiere Pro, but I actually don't even use it anymore. Um, I long ago, like I said, I learned the shortcuts, so I don't really need to look down at it. But but you know what? I, I kind of like how it looks. And, and of course, it protects the keyboard from things like, you know, the remnants of my snacks. <laughs> to go through the list one more time, here again are the five ways to edit more efficiently. Number one, have the required hardware and software. Number two, have a clean and tidy workspace. Number three, Use proxies in your edit. Number four, create a drive infrastructure and stick to it. And lastly, number five, learn and use your keyboard shortcuts. As I mentioned at the outset, lately we've been receiving some feedback about a desire for some shows on editing. Um, so I wanted to get a jump on that with this segment. But you can definitely look forward to some continued segments on post-production in the future, as well as some upcoming professionals who can speak directly to the subject. And speaking of emails asking about editing, let us now go to the Doc Lifer community question of the week, which comes from Vea in New Zealand. Her email reads, Hey Chris, thanks for the link to your film. I can't wait to watch it. I listen to your podcast to and from work every day. I only just discovered this podcast world a couple of weeks ago when I was in desperate need of documentary education, so I've been catching up. I'm six and a half weeks into editing on my first feature documentary. I am finding the edit very exciting, but also exhausting, all-consuming, and a wee bit scary, really. I was fortunate enough to get full New Zealand Film Commission funding, so feeling the pressure to deliver. My film is about a Tongan man, my father, and his devotion to his religion and culture and the impacts this and some of his life decisions have had on my family. Dad is retired but has a paper run to help go towards his monetary donation to his church, where donations are announced and some families give over 20 grand annually. I have been given 10 weeks to have a cut in a presentable state, but at the rate we are going, I can't see this happening. It's almost two years of footage to sift through, and we still don't have a structure yet. Anyway, if you had any more advice surrounding the editing stage, that would be great. Thanks for all your hard work and effort in providing a platform for baby doc lifers to learn from. It is a bit of a lonely space. Malo Alpito. 
Veya, thank you for the thoughtful email. And you're welcome for the TDL platform. As you already know, having delved into the podcasts, a big part of our mission here at The Documentary Life, it's to provide a place for like-minded documentary filmmakers such as yourself to come to get inspired, to learn from one another, and to network with people in our community. As well as discover other people who have the passions that we do, speak the language that we do, and understand the creative lives that we lead. This is a place for that. And the podcast... The podcast is just the tip of the iceberg. In order to properly build the kind of platform that will maximize the sorts of things that I, that I just mentioned, we're going to have to expand our offerings. Believe me when I say that we are hard at work at things like a TDL workshop, a potential TDL retreat, and a membership site. In fact, just this week, we opened up the Documentary Life private Facebook group, and I'll get to that after we address this Doc Life or Community question of the week. So to your email, Vea, congratulations on delving into your first documentary film. This personal doc about your Tongan-raised father and and the impacts of his his decisions on his family, it sounds amazing. I can see why the New Zealand Film Commission would want to fund a film like this. And to have full funding is such a wonderful blessing, right? That is a very fortunate thing to have. Of course, what comes with that is a certain amount of responsibility and pressure. And it sounds like that is a bit of what you're feeling right now. Well, that and that entire, of course. So I'd like to take a moment to share a portion of the email that I responded to Vea with. And this is what I said to Vea. Your project sounds like a personal and powerful one. Congratulations on getting it shot, receiving the grant award, and for being into full-blown uh, post-production. And you're right. Editing, especially for first longer length films, can be a pretty nerve wracking, if not intimidating endeavor. But you know what? You are not alone. In fact, I'd say even second and third and and, and tenth time doc filmmakers are almost always nervous about their edits, especially when they have a timeline in which to finish. But take comfort in knowing that they almost always get done. And so will yours. You've actually inspired me to do a show or two that focus solely on editing and post-production. I do believe it's high time for it. And the thing is, my base and background is totally editing. So it's, it's actually kind of funny that I've not yet done this, though I somewhat discussed the subject in a much earlier episode. Lastly, I'm going to reach out to Costa Boats, an esteemed Kiwi Daco, whom we had on the program back in July. He has, I believe it was episode number 28. He has a ton of experience editing loads of footage on a short timeline. He's a pretty busy guy and might be knee deep into a project right now of his own, but I'm going to reach out and see if if he might be able to take a call from a fellow doc lifer. He'd be great for inspiration and insight. If you'd like me to do this, I'll try and reach out. Now that last part's an important one because I've since reached out to Costa and, and he was very happy to accommodate a discussion with a fellow documentary filmmaker. Um, he was more than willing to offer up his insight and knowledge you know, in order to help a fellow doc lifer along their own documentary path, which to me is just awesome. That's exactly the kind of thing that I want to see more and more happening here um, with TDL. So Vea, if you do end up taking advantage of this opportunity, please do write us back and let us know what you learned with your conversation as well as how you employed it with your project. Also, I do hope that you liked our opening segment of today's show, Vea. It was certainly inspired in part by your journey, your own journey into post-production. As I mentioned, there will be more editing segments and post-production industry guests in the future. I'm definitely seeing a need for some of this type of programming. So thanks again for your email, Vea. If you'd like to offer up some feedback of your own or give us some topic or guest suggestions, we would love to hear from you. So so please email me with them at chris at barongfilms.com. And you too could be included in a future Doc Life or Community Question of the Week segment. Now, as I mentioned earlier in this segment, we are happy to announce the Documentary Life private Facebook group. Anyone who receives the Doc Lifer newsletter has already received a special email inviting them personally to be a part of the TDL Facebook group. And now, with the release of this podcast, we would like to open it up to you, Doc Lifers. To give you some idea what the Documentary Life private Facebook group is about, it's a place for fellow Doc Lifers to share valuable information, to collaborate with other filmmakers and to provide others with constructive feedback, advice, and support on documentary-related topics. 
This is a community where you should feel comfortable sharing the struggles and challenges you face. Because as we know from this podcast, there are most likely others who have have already experienced the same thing in the past or who are currently experiencing it or certainly who will at some point experience it in the future. Likewise, you should feel comfortable sharing successes or breakthroughs so that others in the community can learn more about what's working for you. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to note here that this is an advertisement-free community. There are no ads allowed in this private Facebook group. This community, it's all about sharing valuable information in a way that can help others and allow members to garner support when they need it. The community is is also to help you build and grow your relationships with one another and to build connections and friendships worldwide. To be a part of the Documentary Life private Facebook group, you can search for the Documentary Life Facebook group, and, and I say group, not page, but group, and apply from there. I will also be putting a direct link to the show up on our show notes. By the way, are you sensing a theme here? Because I am. You should be visiting show notes like after every show, people. Seriously, you need to start considering the show notes section for episodes, um, considering it as a supplement to the week's show. Anyhow, if if you have any questions or concerns or need help with the Documentary Life private Facebook group, please don't hesitate to to reach out to my wife, the producer of TDL, and her email is stephanie at barongfilms.com. That's S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E at B-A-R-A-N-G-F-I-L-M-S dot com. Stephanie at barongfilms.com. We want this group to be an active and engaged group of documentary filmmakers, both new and old, who want to not only learn from one another, but be contributing to the discussion of documentary filmmaking and documentary living as well. And in order to best do that, we need you, Doc Lifer. So go sign up for this awesome support group today. When we come back from the break, get ready to get inspired and informed not only by a documentary filmmaker whose name is C. Fitz, but also the person who is the very subject of her film, whose name is Jewel Tice Williams. My shared conversation with the Doc Industry guest person segment is up next. I am Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is The Documentary Life. There are plenty of places online to learn how to do things like split the audio signals coming into your camera, or how to animate some of your still photos, or get some great tips on lighting your interview, many blogs, YouTube videos, and of course podcasts where you can quickly grab an answer to a tech-related question. But what if there was one place where you could learn from beginning to end how to make a documentary film, and how to become a doc filmmaker, how to raise money and build an audience for your doc, how to form strategic partnerships and launch your doc out into the world, and perhaps even, if you can imagine, make some money from it? Well, there is such a place, and it's called the Documentary Academy. Steph and I took two years to build out this comprehensive resource that takes you step by step from story creation and pre-production all the way to post-production, launch, and distribution. The Academy takes you through your doc filmmaking journey as your most confident, active, strategic, creative, focused, and articulate self. It is a step-by-step guide to empowerment in the documentary filmmaking world. We know what we have in the Documentary Academy. Now it's up to you to discover what you have as a doc filmmaker. Do that today by heading over to thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Today, I'm happy to have as a guest on The Documentary Life, C. Fitz. Fitz is a television and marketing vet, a guru, if you will, and we'll get into that in a bit. And she's also the director of the current documentary film, Jules Catch One, which I have just had the pleasure of recently seeing. And so I can't wait to talk with Fitz about that. So here we are, Fitz. Thank you so much for being a guest on the program. Thank you, Chris, so much. Very excited to be here. So, so Fitz, I think what I'd love to do, and I, and I do this a bit with, with, with guests, is I kind of love to give a bit of a contextual sort of background so it can kind of give us an idea on where we're headed with, with, with sort of your, this idea of a documentary life. Now, 
in, in learning more about you and doing some research, I came upon the fact that, of course, you worked in your background, you worked in sort of this early on idea of American reality television, in particular as a producer on something like Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, a, a reality c- series that was not only big for Bravo, but again, it, it was big for where reality and this whole uns- idea of unscripted genre where it would go. How did you find yourself involved with the program and what was that experience like? Well, that was a a lot of fun. We started, it was one of the first TV shows that was basically a make better reality show. And um, the five guys that were in the original pilot, I had a lot to do with um, getting the pilot off the ground with Scout Productions. And um, it was a lot of fun. It was really, really challenging back then. It was one of, uh, you know, Bravo's first real dips in and boy were they brave to take on <laughs> you know the the whole show but gosh it was it was great you know you actually did change some lives with that show right you know with all the comedy and and fun that went around it you also learned a lot and it was it was a lot of fun to help you know get that show off the ground with scout productions and um david collins michael williams at the forefront of that mm-hmm. it was really wonderful and, 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 and for our listeners who may not be familiar with the program, can you give us a, a brief synopsis of, of what it was about and, and what, it, what, what a show like Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, what did that look like? Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. They took one lucky straight guy <laughs> that we cast and we had um, five wonderful guys that were the Queer Eye team and they made over the straight guy. And this is going back to about 2003. Right, and right. they they would give them a makeover, which, you know, if everything from doing their nails to uh, ripping off, waxing their their back uh, <laughs> hair <laughs> and and giving them some tips on, you know, what they could wear to work on a first date, bringing in some culture, some food tips. I mean, it ran the gamut. They did a full makeover for this one lucky fellow. Um, and it was a lot of fun. And, and give us an idea how long you've been working in the industry up to this point to be then brought on as a producer for the show. Well, the um, the creators, Michael Williams and David Collins, uh, were my location scouts, hence Scout Productions. <laughs> and we all did commercials back in the day for right. many, many years. Right. And then they got this pilot from Bravo and uh, asked me to come on board for the pilot to produce it. And they were definitely at the forefront of a new format. Hmm. And, uh, you know, it was just a wonderful thing to be a part of. And it went on for many years. Another TV show that was a big one for you early on was it was a show called Knock First, uh, which was, I believe, an ABC family production. And you worked as a showrunner, correct? Yeah, I started off as a supervising producer and grew into the showrunner. It was started in Boston, which is where we're all from. Okay. And it was again, another sort of life altering show, even though it was a reality show, we were making over these kids rooms and we Mm. gave them, uh, choices throughout the process with our designer and carpenters that we would show up with and they would get choices to empower them to make their space work better for them in their lives. And fortunately for some of the product placement like Apple and things like that, we could bring in products that would also enhance them. So if they were interested in music or music recording or video editing, we would try to set them up in their room, in their space. Mm. So they they could be creative and make it a a great environment for them going forward. And we, we definitely did all different walks of life on the show. We did 103 uh, episodes in the course of two years, two seasons. Okay. And, um, it was amazing to go into some of the, these kids lives that didn't have really anything and, you know, gift them not only just a redesign, we went a step further. We tried to give them tools and, and things that would help them get on the road to being more creative, encourage their, their creative juices and mentor them in the process of doing the show. So trying to help them, you know, towards a a better future. At this point, all of this is kind of shaping perhaps you as a documentary filmmaker. And I guess I would start out then by asking, at what point did you consider yourself 
documentary filmmaker? Or at what point did you did you think about producing your first doc? I think I've always been a writer at heart. And I think that anybody who does documentaries and really digs in and does a feature documentary, especially they're writers at heart. And I've always been writing my whole life. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. And, you know, you find that subject that you think is important, right. that that, you know, you can take on and go the distance with. For mm. me, you know, it, it's usually about every five years, six years in the case of Jules Catch One where I really dig in and research and spend time with my subject matter to, to shape the documentary, to bring it to the world. And so far that's how long it's taken me with my documentaries. I do have a short that's taken shorter, um, less time, (laughs) but for the features, you know, for my subject matter that I've taken on, you know, you really have to be in love with it. You really have to want to go the, the distance and know that it's that important to do. Um, throughout my whole life, whether it be reality TV or commercials, I've always been working at writing and finding my next passion project that I know that I can go the distance with. For four decades, Catch One was a legendary Los Angeles nightclub. It was an institution where celebrities, politicians, and everyday people of all colors, cultures, and backgrounds converged. The catch came to be known as the unofficial Studio 54 of the West Coast. The bangingest music. You came here prepared to dance. I've danced in this club in jock straps <laughs> with cowboy boots. And I would go in there and dance, and everyone would leave me alone. It's a fat club, and it's a fat neighborhood. Catch was uh, created to fulfill a need. At the time that uh, we opened, 19, mid-1970s, there was still a, an abundance of, of racism. The Catch offered a place where any and everybody could come. We've encountered a lot of racism in our, in our days, you know. They throw things at us. I'm Jewel Tice Williams. I wear lots and lots of hats. She started off with four strikes. Not only was she poor, not only was she a woman she was a lesbian and on top of that a black woman if we could find everybody that she's inspired uh, they would be lined up for blocks and blocks and blocks across the city the four businesses operated under the village health foundation are the village health clinic the vegan village internet cafe village manor and the catch one night the special part is that no one is turned away. You had people who wouldn't touch people with AIDS. They wouldn't go to your club if there was AIDS-related people in there. Young men in the backyard of the Catch One, some were ill, uh, didn't know where they were going to sleep. Jewel was the person who was trying to take care of all of them, giving them a place to come. The cops coming into my place night after night with their rifles and things drawn. I said, when are you guys going to stop harassing me? Their whole point was to instill fear and intimidation against the gay community, and especially the black gay community. Jewel's much more an icon and a hero than than any celebrity. What are you going to do next, Jewel? Why was this a subject that was so attractive to you that you thought, hey, you know what? This is my next doc. I had just finished uh, my first feature, and uh, one year later, I met Jewel. <laughs> and how I met Jewel, <laughs> uh, how I met Jewel was uh, I volunteered my time to direct a short piece. She was winning an award at a charity that oh. I was I donated my time to, and it was you know the call was to do a two to three minute piece on the award of winner, course. which was Jewel that right, year. Right, perfect. And the very first day I met her, I said, I don't know how I'm going to put your life, <laughs> your amazing story, and all the history around Catch One, yeah, the legendary Catch One, into two to three minutes. <laughs> yeah. We we have to do a documentary on you and Catch One because at that point in the research I had done in the Cliff Notes, I knew that there wasn't that much out there. Hmm. on this incredible woman and catch one there were little snippets in newspapers there was um a short piece done there was a news piece done but few and far between she just 
was an unknown and and i just Which couldn't let it go <laughs> i know i mean all that she's done and i just couldn't stand there and let the story go and not let the world to the best of my ability hear her story and that was the decision i made that day and and she said yes which was great <laughs> and and on went our journey where i wow you know dug in deeper and shared photographs and, and got into the community and went to every single library and newspaper in town to start, you know, the process of the full research on Jules Catch One. Well, and it's easy to see from a, from a documentary filmmaker or a doc story perspective how you could be so attracted to Jewel and, and to her story. I mean, there's there's rags to riches in there. There's there's against the man. There's against all odds. And, and many times I felt like she's like the ultimate underdog story. And and she's incredibly inspirational. Um, she she's she's an inspiration to humanity. She's an in, inspiration to you know fellow entrepreneurs. I can see I can see how you would be so attracted to her. So there's all those things, right? Those things, as we know as doc filmmakers, they work great on paper. But what was it upon actually meeting with her and speaking with her and seeing her on camera that you knew there was something inside you, right? That knew that you wanted to tell her story and that she would be a successful story, uh, a successful story to tell and she would be successful on the screen. Does that make sense? How did, how did you, what was it? Can you describe maybe a moment or, or how you knew that she was going to translate well on the screen? Well, uh, I think it was about her story, about knowing that just one person, Jewel, did all this in at that point, you know, 37 years um, that she that she could accomplish so much in in that time and that she was so dedicated. It's it was really the story and the facts that were going to really go the distance mm -hmm. and and the community that just loved this woman that were so grateful to her for right. changing their lives, for impacting their lives in all different walks of life were impacted as I dug into the story and met people from Jules Catch One, from Catch One itself, mm. being patrons back in the day to current ones, uh, the club was still going on, to also her clinic, uh, the Village Health Foundation, and the impact that she made. And at that point, she was also running a vegan restaurant <laughs> underneath right. Catch One. Right. So she had this whole corner, you know, she went from buying the the produce and, and products in the morning to going over and being in her uh, village health foundation and administrating acupuncture to those that needed it. And then at night she was running catch one, the <laughs> nightclub. I mean, what just in a day, what an amazing day. <laughs> How right? does one so, human uh, being, let alone 10 yeah, do that? Right. So uh, it was knowing that that just that could inspire people. Right. and inspire others' lives, just hearing her story and yeah. all that she did. Yeah, yeah. I think by nature, certainly nowadays, most of us doc filmmakers are, are we have to be entrepreneurs. And certainly, um, certainly that is the case with your, with your self fits. And when you describe what, what, what her story was all about and, and the sort of the entrepreneurship, which was a large part of, 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 of her background and really who she was. What did you sort of take from that, that relationship? What did you learn from her as an entrepreneur yourself? I think as an entrepreneur, um, you know, the things that you take away from Jewel's story, they coincide with making a feature documentary. It's the patience and perseverance it's the reason we make a lot of the documentaries that get made that are important to our history. And it was really sticking with it over years, over, you know, personal ups and downs, over, you know, being able to put together the crew or not, <laughs> the editing process that is, you know, it, for me, it took over a year and it wound up, you know, in my kitchen the last <laughs> six to eight months uh, with an editor. And it's that's entrepreneurship. Yeah. Perseverance, you know, you, baby. Yeah. You are out there doing something for a reason. You know that it in your heart that it matters. You don't know if it's going to matter to the world yeah, or right. to anybody. <laughs> and you're just in it to win it. You know, as an entrepreneur, I think every documentary 
especially feature filmmaker um, and, and shorts as well. You know, if, if that's what resonates with the subject matter, every documentary filmmaker that's doing it really on their own is an entrepreneur, right? You are putting it together, whether it's a proper business in air quotes or not. Every documentary is every documentary. You are an entrepreneur and making that come to realization to be a piece, Mm -hmm. to be a film, you know, you're the entrepreneur producing, directing, whether you get to have a team, the luxury of having a team or not, Mm -hmm. you're putting it together and making it happen. And then doing the film festival circuit and trying to get it to the world. It's, uh, it's what I took away from, um, you know, Jewel was that she just never gave up and, Neither did I with Jules Catch One. Yeah. I never thought it would take six years, now seven and a half, yeah, yeah. to reach the main audiences. And, you know, I'm, I've, I haven't given up yet. I'll never give up um, because I think it's such an important story for so many people, not just students, of course, in all the schools, but just our history to know about this woman and her story and all that she did and, and help inspire, especially today. Hmm you know, future uh, people (laughs) and to get a voice, to be a voice, to not be afraid to be a voice. So I think, you know, you take away by watching Jules' story and and also stories like Jules' Catch One that took over six years to make, that it's important to follow your heart and to follow your dreams. And especially if you think that it, it can make an impact on other people's lives. And that's what Jewel did over all those years. She's of service to her community, of service to people. And that's what I was doing with the film too, trying to show people her life, her story, to be of service for the future. It makes me think of something that, that I believe Sharon Stone may have said in the film, and, and I'll go ahead and, and read this. I believe Sharon said what she did in the kind of community outpouring that happened because of her generosity and goodness and the awareness, which is, I think, key in anything that we do is just to create awareness, awareness and acceptance. Fitz, do you think that docs can create change? Certainly awareness, right? Certainly awareness. But but can docs create any kind of true and real change? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's documentaries telling the history of the past that can create a lot of change through their awareness through creating awareness and by showing, you know, the facts about either a life or the facts about our history. For instance, um, Ava's 13th that was recently honored, um, Mm. at the, at the Oscars nominated. Right. And there's a lot of documentaries that create change by just telling the story Mm. and telling it well, So people can understand what really happened, whether it be Jewel's story or the story of, you know, our past. I think it matters in in helping people see what's happened and inspiring them, lighting a fire underneath some folks Mm. to stand up, to be a voice themselves. I, I definitely think documentaries are at the crux of that. Yeah. We need more jewels, more voices to be heard, whether it be through, you know, the medium of a documentary or our social media carrying the message out to the community. I think it's really important to to keep our support behind folks that are making documentaries, making short stories, getting voices heard, because it helps the whole community, the ones that lay silent mm. or the ones that are afraid to stand up for themselves or who they are and everybody's different and every everybody's ride is different in this world but stories like Jules Catch One I think can help a lot of people stand up and or support those that are standing up because you can make a difference just by supporting a jewel in in your life right Mm -hmm. absolutely I'd like to dig a little bit deeper in this idea of, of entrepreneurship. And, and of course, we as doc filmmakers, as self-entrepreneurs, we live in a social media world. Doc filmmakers 
by necessity, as I alluded to earlier, we're self entrepreneurs nowadays. So how can we how can we best be promoting ourselves and our documentary films? And specifically, how can we be best be doing this through the use of social media? I think it's important for doc filmmakers to embrace social media, whether you even have your own personal Facebook page or not. Mm. Honestly, it can help your product, your film reach the audience, which is why you're making it in the first place. Right, right. So find out where your audience lives. It could be Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Find out where they live. Could even be Snapchat. Who knows? Depending yeah. on your subject matter. Yeah, yeah. But find out where they, they live, where where they have fun, where they spend most of their time, and make sure you have that platform for your film. And set it up well before you've even finished editing. <laughs> and that's yes. the best advice I can give because you should start it. You should, you know, start saying coming soon, even right. though you might fall behind in deadlines and everything else. We all know that happens, but set yourself up so you can reach those people that you're breaking your back, making the film to reach. And uh, social media is a great tool to use. It's the best tool right now. And you can give them little snippets of it that could help you know tease your film you can give them behind the scenes of you editing mm. all that great stuff you know helps grow your audience and it's always it's it's slow going at first and you know even myself who works in social media you know my documentary is is my second third fourth job right, every right. day and uh you know you have to feed the machine and do the best that you can but it certainly helps uh, your community know what's coming up, know what film festivals coming up. You'll you'll want that all in place. And we talk a bit about this on the program, this idea of having that social media in place well before certainly certainly as you as you had alluded to, well before the the maybe even the post production process. But I, I would say even you know earlier than that, we talk a lot about when you're running any sort of you know any sort of crowdfunding campaign. Um, it's, it's amazing how many times you run into people that are running that, that say that they want to run a, a, a Kickstarter campaign or an Indiegogo and, and, and they, they run it and, and they're not successful in, in a large part because it's the first time anyone's heard of their film and, mm -hmm. and, and they haven't had any sort of social media in place prior to this, their Kickstarter campaign. And we talk a lot about that, that, you know, you really need to be not only sort of doing the social media well before you run a campaign like this for the for for in the interest of the campaign but also because you're building your audience well before your film comes out and so it's kind of a, a two-pronged sort of attack um and, and and not to not not to go off on a tangent but but to reel it back in a bit it's going along with what you're saying is the social media platforms should be you should be using them and they should you, you should be using them regularly and they should be well in place certainly before you do any sort of crowdfunding campaign would you agree with that definitely agree with that i learned the hard way so mine yeah. weren't in place and i think the biggest lesson is getting those platforms those social media platforms in place so that when you do go for crowdfunding, whether it be for finishing funds or, you know, anything like that, you've built up your community. They know exactly who you are. They know exactly, you know, how long you've been working on, on this and will be sympathetic to seeing, mm. you know, it to the finish line with you. Mm. Um, all those great things. And it's it's hard to ask uh, for, you know, funds when everybody probably has a day job, a separate life everything yeah. and you know your documentary is cash poor and you just need to get to the finish line and uh you know some documentary filmmakers it's hard to ask and um i don't think anybody loves asking but if you're <laughs> passionate enough about your subject you'll you'll keep asking till you get there and one day you will <laughs> one hopes um you know we're at the tail end of raising funds for our music licenses yes so we can go mainstream so that's something that we're doing. And, you know, we've had some success with folks that have seen us on the film festival circuit, seen how hard we've worked going yeah. out to the festivals ourselves, yeah. running around, you know, getting the word out and educating people at some schools. And, you know, they want to help us reach mainstream audiences. And that's where my film is, Jules Catch One. We're right on the precipice of that. And right at the tail end, we've gotten, you know, over two thirds of what we need. 
Um, we've negotiated the music licenses down with a wonderful music supervisor, Sean Fernald. And it's been a great, you know, thing to have a crowd funding source out yeah, there yeah. and, and see your community help you back for all your hard work. Um, some folks are just so thrilled. They, they've seen it in the film festival circuit and then they're like, oh gosh, you know, they, they're just finishing the finishing line for mainstream audiences. Yes, right. I've seen this film. It's great. You know, here's $50 and yep. every little bit helps, you know, definitely reach that finish line. Well, and, and, and you are running a crowdfunding campaign for Jules Catch One right now. And I do believe it's for the music licensing, which, which you had said, how can we, how can we go there? Where, where do we go oh, to contribute? I will tell you how yeah. to go there. So <laughs> it's a, it's a GoFundMe page, which we, um, we really liked and embraced for our film yeah. and it's at www.gofundme backslash jewels catch one all one word so it's pretty easy um gofundme slash jewels catch one and we've got all the notes in there where the money's going towards and we're really excited as of september 1st we finally got the 12 major label songs negotiated down to something that we we can do with that's within our budget and we're right. just at the tail end and so i'll go we're ahead excited and, excellent and you should be and i'll go ahead and get the uh i'll go ahead and put the the the, the link for the go your gofundme campaign up on our show notes as well yeah that would be great and we're on for, for facebook yes. and instagram we're at jules catch one documentary again all written out jules catch one documentary so so love us there, yeah. um, and uh, we definitely could use all the support, and also the GoFundMe is is there as well. Now, Fitz, as we wrap up here on the documentary life, you have a bit of an exciting announcement that really just kind of came down in the pipeline from what I understand in the past week. You want to share that with us? Oh, gosh, yes. We I have been working uh, on a wonderful campaign for Star Wars, which is the new movie that comes out in December. I've heard of it. And I've heard of it. Yeah. yeah, right. I think we might know. <laughs> and uh, that was really exciting for us because not only was it Disney, of course, and the Star Wars um, whole platform, but yeah. it was Lucas Films. It was Verizon. We had wonderful clients. And at the forefront was the group, the creative group that I work with, Denizen. And they're a wonderful creative group that I work with a lot. I produced the spot, um, the marketing campaign, the star Wars we just launched last Thursday. It has over a million views on Facebook. <laughs> um, I know it's a lot of fun. It's on our dancing pictures, uh, Facebook page. Awesome. So you can okay. see it there. Okay, great. And yeah, if you just Google it too, cause of all the views, it's just been fantastic. And there's never uh, been seen before props that are in the upcoming movie. But the most important <laughs> thing is we, we had a lot of fun. We built a spaceship in LA and we, we brought it all the way to New York comic con. No yeah. It was really crazy. And we did it all within six weeks. So talk about, yeah. you know, stress aggressive schedule level. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Of course. It was a big, big <laughs> producer job that I am fortunate enough to say I pulled off, but, uh, it was a lot of design, a lot of fun. And it, we worked with real fans. A lot of the stuff that I do, which, oh, nice. which I loved about working on my documentary, is I get to work with real people. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, whether they be celebrities or real people, it's it, they have a passion for what they do. And it's bringing that to light. So we worked with real people at New York Comic Con, and we did this special surprise for them over and over again. We did about 18 or 19 takes on that wonderful Friday, New York comic con. Wow. And the video that you're about to see yeah. uh, from the link is from that. And it's really a blast. It's really great. Can't wait to share it with everyone. That's wonderful. Huge congratulations for, for oh, you and your thank team. You. That's yeah, amazing. Keep creating content. That's the point. Yeah. It is. It certainly is. And I can't wait to see Jules catch one, get uh, an even bigger release than it, than it has. And uh, it's a wonderful film, an incredible, inspiring story. And uh, thank you so much, Fitz, for, for coming on The Documentary Life. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Chris, for having us. And, uh, you know, just a note, Jewel still works to this day at her Village Health Foundation, you know, <laughs> it, which is amazing at 78, right? So, I mean, you know, and, and then, you know, after watching this film, and, and I'm, I'm sure she'll get this if she hasn't already, I, I just want to go to L.A. And, and just find where she is just to give, just to hug her and just say, thank you for being yeah. you. <laughs> you don't know yeah. me from anyone, but I just wanted to thank you. <laughs> 
Yeah. And, and we can do that in our own backyard. You That's know, right. you think about that and, and, you know, you go out into your neighborhood and you give somebody uh, a smile, you help them out, you find out what they need. And that's what Jewel did on her corner. She found out what they needed and she helped create it. She helped create it, obviously, um, on a large, large scale, but we all can do that. And, and that's just a great thing. Thank you so much, Fitz. And uh, I wish you continued success with all that you do. And certainly, especially with Jewel's Catch One. Ah, great. Thanks, Chris. Thank you for having us. Bye. Don't forget, we'd love to have you join us in the Documentary Academy. Come and take a look at how we can help you make your best documentary film at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. That's thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.